Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Kerry Parker. Today, we have episode 343 for September 25th, 2023. I got a new show for you this week. Got several fun and interesting and important topics to cover for you today. Real quick, before I get to the, the kind of the rundown of the articles we're going to cover today, a couple quick notes. First of all, the Delete Act, uh, which we talked to Tom Kemp about at length when he was on the show recently, has passed the legislature in California. Uh, it has not, however, been signed by the governor, Governor Gavin Newsom. And so I've heard, I've tried to look into this. It sounds like it's not a done deal. Like he is still thinking about whether to sign it. So if you are a California resident, now would be a really good time to lobby your governor's office for the passage of the Delete Act. And you will be doing us all a favor because the implications will spread far beyond California. Also, I just attended the B-Sides RDU yesterday. Uh, This is one of the InfoSec conferences that kind of spun out of DEF CON many years ago with a lot more of a local flair and a lot more about trying to get new voices to be heard in the InfoSec community. Uh, And I've been going actually to the B-Sides RDU for a lot longer than I've been going to the other conferences. I worked with a guy at Cisco who actually helped start the local chapter. So anyway, it was great. I had, had a chance to catch up with some of my local InfoSec peeps. I also met some new people. Shout out to a couple of fun marketing guys I met from Red Hat. And I also had a chance to speak at length with a gentleman named Jack Daniel, who is one of the founders of B-Sides. Very interesting guy. And I invited him to be a guest on the show, and he was all about it. So um, uh, it may take a little while to get that together, but uh, assuming I can get him on the show, that will be a very, very interesting interview. All right, so let's do a quick rundown. Here's what we're going to be talking about today on the news. There's been a critical vulnerability found in a WebP library, which unfortunately is used all over the place. Basically, it means you're going to have to update like <laughs> like everything. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that when we read the article. The three credit bureaus there in the United States have finally allowed you to get your credit report for free multiple times a year. I'll tell you why that is a good idea. Proton has just announced a new CAPTCHA. That is actually an acronym for Completely Automated Public Touring Test to Tell Computers and Humans Apart. It's that annoying little pop-up that, <laughs> that makes you prove that you're not a robot. Google's been creating a really interesting version of that for a long time, uh, but because it's from Google, it also has privacy implications, and that is one of the reasons that Proton has stepped up to create their own. So anyway, I'll get into more about that in a minute. The Federal Trade Commission here in the U.S. is ramping up its efforts against data brokers. I've got a couple articles about LastPass. One is more of an update of the kind of things they're doing and kind of the sad state of affairs there. But there was another article that I think is good to read here, and it's about why we shouldn't be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Because a lot of people, I think, have looked at these LastPass problems and said, oh, the password managers, they suck. I shouldn't use one. Well, you should. And uh, and I've got a really good article that talks about why. Also, Hyundai, the car maker, is creating this Hyundai Pay thing. So you can actually put credit cards in your car and pay for things like parking from your vehicle. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I've got a really interesting article from a blog that I actually had not heard about before called The Privacy Dad. But I thought it was really interesting. And it's uh, the title of the article is Privacy Tools Are Not Worth the Hassle. As you might expect, the article kind of goes into maybe why that's not exactly true. But nevertheless, I thought it was a very interesting read and I wanted to read the article and then kind of give my take on that. And then finally, for the tip of the week, I've got an article about this and we'll just make it the tip of the week. iOS 17 has just come out on Apple devices, you know, iPhones and iPads. And it's got uh, a few really interesting security and privacy features that I want to talk about. So that will be our tip of the week. All right, so let's get to the news. All right, first up, this is a big one. Um, So basically, you really honestly going to want to be updating just about everything, like looking for updates to all your major applications and your device operating systems. This is that bad. So let me read this article from Make Use Of. A critical vulnerability in the WebP codec has been discovered, forcing major browsers to fast-track security updates. However, widespread use of the same WebP rendering code means countless apps are also affected until they release security patches. The issue in the WebP codec has been named CVE-2023-4863. The root lies within a specific function of the WebP rendering code, or the called the Build Huffman table, for those of you who care. 
making the codec vulnerable to heap buffer overflows. A heap buffer overflow occurs when a program writes more data to a memory buffer than it's designed to hold. When this happens, it can potentially overwrite adjacent memory and corrupt data. Worse still, hackers can exploit heap buffer overflows to take over systems and devices remotely. Hackers can target apps known to have buffer overflow vulnerabilities and send them malicious data. For example, they could upload a malicious WebP image that deploys code on the user's device when they view it in their browser or another app. This kind of vulnerability existing in code as widely used as WebP codec is a serious issue. Aside from major browsers, countless apps use the same codec to render WebP images. At this stage, the CVE-2023-4863 vulnerability is too widespread for us to know how big it really is, and the cleanup is going to be messy. So, is it safe to use my favorite browser? Yes, most major browsers have already released updates to address this issue. So as long as you update your apps to the latest version, you can browse the web as usual. Google, Mozilla, Microsoft, Brave, and Tor have all released security patches, and others have probably done so by the time you're reading this. And then it goes on to uh, list the various versions of these. I'm not going to read them out here. If you're really curious what versions are fixed, then you can check uh, the show notes and find the link. So if you're using a different browser, check for the latest updates and look for specific references to CVE-2023-4863 heap buffer overflow vulnerability in WebP. If you can't find a reference to this vulnerability in the latest version of your favorite browser, switch to one listed above until a fix is released for your browser of choice. So am I safe using my favorite apps? This is where it gets tricky. Unfortunately, the CVE-2023-4863 WebP vulnerability also affects an unknown number of apps. And I'm going to return to that point here in a minute. Firstly, any software using the libwebp library is affected by this vulnerability, which means each provider will need to release their own security patches. To make matters more complicated, this vulnerability is baked into many popular frameworks used to build apps. In these instances, the frameworks need updating first, and then software providers using them need to update to the latest version to protect their users. This makes it very difficult for the average user to know which apps are affected and which ones have addressed the issue. As discovered by Alex uh, Ivanos at Stack Diary, affected apps include Microsoft Teams, Slack, Skype, Discord, Telegram, 1Password, Signal, LibreOffice, and Affinity Suite, among many more. 1Password has released an update to address the issue, although its announcement page includes a typo for the CVE-2023-4863 vulnerability ID, ending with Dash 36 instead of Dash 63. Apple has also released a security patch for macOS that appears to resolve the same problem, but it doesn't reference it specifically. I hate when they do that. I wish they would call those out specifically. Likewise, Slack released a security update on September 12th, but doesn't reference CVE-2023-4863. Again, why you wouldn't reference these things specifically is beyond me. Anyway, moving on. Uh, so you need to update everything. As a user, the only thing you can do about this CVE vulnerability is to update everything. Start with every browser you use and then work your way through your most important apps. Check the latest release versions of every app you can and look for specific references to CVE 2023 4863. If you can't find references to this vulnerability in the latest release notes, consider switching to a secure alternative until your preferred app addresses the issue. If this isn't an option, check for security updates released after September 12th and keep updating as soon as new security patches are released. This won't guarantee that the CVE is being addressed, but it's the best fallback option you've got at this point. Google P launched WebP in 2010 as a solution to rendering images faster in browsers and other applications. The format provides lossy and lossless compression that can reduce the size of image files by 30% while maintaining perceptible quality. Performance-wise, WebP is a fine solution for reducing rendering times. However, it's also a cautionary tale of prioritizing a specific aspect of performance over others, namely security. When half-baked development meets widespread adoption, it creates a perfect storm for source vulnerabilities. And with zero-day exploits on the rise, companies like Google need to up their game or developers will have to scrutinize technologies more. Okay, so this sounds bad, and it, and it is. Luckily, if you're following the, the advice that I give here all the time, your apps are set to auto-update, your OS is set to auto-update, and as soon as these things are available, you will have them. It's really, it's really bad. So you haven't really heard of WebP much. It's not a common image format. You know, we think of JPEG and PNG. 
uh, as more common images, maybe even GIF or GIF. But WebP has gotten very popular, partially, I think, because of the licensing, I think. And that was one of the reasons Google did it, not just the, the performance and shrinking image sizes. And you may notice, by the way, if you I do this quite a bit because I save images from the web all the time, that when you try to save an image just by dragging and dropping or do a save as, a lot of times the format is WebP. It's not JPEG or PNG. So it, it's used all over the place. In fact, a lot of times websites will change the images that are uploaded and make them WebP versions to make them load faster. So even if the image wasn't originally uploaded in that format, a lot of times it's converted to that format. And it is used all over the place. I mean, you think Signal, like why does Signal do it? Well, Signal has a built-in image rendering tool, like, you know, for avatars and things like that. Those are images and sometimes they're in WebP format. So a lot of these apps, if they ever need to show an image, will often include this library. So this brings me actually to the point I wanna make here, and that is, this is why software bill of materials or SBOMs are so important. And this is why we really need these things because if we had a widespread use of SBOMs, that would mean that every application would have basically an ingredients list of here are all the things that went into making this app. And a lot of times those things are outside the control of the original developer. We don't reinvent the wheel. So if someone's got a really good, free, easy to use, what we think is robust library or framework for rendering images, why would I write that again myself? I'll just use what someone else is going to give me. Unfortunately, what that means is when those, you know, when those things have problems, like in this case, it can be hard to know which applications included not only that library, but what version of that library they have included. That's exactly the problem that SBOMs are meant to solve and why they are so important. And we talked to Alan Friedman about that uh, a while back. I would love to bring him back on the show to discuss uh, where things stand with these things now. But anyway, SBOMs are a big deal. Uh, it's mostly for software developers, but this is exactly the kind of situation where it would be really handy to have had SBOMs for all of our apps and and operating systems and things so that we know which apps are affected by this problem. All right, moving on. Quick uh, article here from Consumer Reports. The U.S.'s three largest credit bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, said this week that they will make permanent consumers' access to free weekly credit reports via annualcreditreport.com, something the bureaus began at, at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. That's important because so much of a person's financial life, the ability to get a car, student or home loan, a credit card, or even the ability to rent an apartment, sign up for a cell phone plan, or get a job is affected by information found in their credit report. Errors in credit reports are a problem. In fact, they are the most common complaint made by consumers to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau about credit reports, according to a recent CR analysis. What's more, a nationally representative CR survey of, 20, of about 2,000 U.S. adults in January of 2022 found that 14% of people who had ever checked their credit reports said they had found errors. Previously, only one credit report from each of the bureaus was available free of charge on an annual basis, with the exception of Equifax, which had provided six free, free reports a year after the massive data breach in 2017. Beyond that, the bureaus charged as much as $14 per report. So the article goes on a little bit, and I think it's important to know that you can now get your reports as basically as often as you want. But the other part of this article I thought was really interesting was this last part about how to fix errors in your credit report. So let me read that. There are some steps to take if you get a report and find a mistake, and it may take some work. Take it from Steve Saxon, 69, in Sonoma County, California, who says he grappled with a major error he found five years ago when shopping around for a home improvement loan. During that time, he says his score dropped by an appreciable amount, and upon reviewing his credit report, he discovered a medical bill that was sent to collections that wasn't his, but from a provider he'd been to more than a decade earlier. Saxon filed a dispute with a credit bureau where he'd found the error and placed more than a dozen calls to the doctor's office, debt collector, and credit bureau. And this is a quote from Saxon, quote, I put an awful lot of effort into getting this fixed and doing so raised my credit score substantially, unquote. Indeed, when a credit report lists a debt in collections as late, it could lower your credit score by up to 100 points, says CR's Ryan Reynolds. And obviously that's a different Ryan Reynolds than the one you're thinking about. Other errors, such as debt that has been paid off but is reported as unpaid, or accounts that should be reported as closed but are listed as still open, can also lower a credit score. So if you find an error in your report, here are six steps to take to help remedy the situation. 
First, file a dispute with each credit bureau. The three major bureaus of Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion don't communicate with one another, so it's smart to contact each one. Filing a dispute with each credit bureau instead of uh, the lender or the bank offers protections governing how quickly it must be handled. It also provides a legal pathway to sue the credit bureaus and creditors or collectors if necessary. Two, gather evidence. If you are filing a dispute about a debt that's reported incorrectly, include account statements or payment records. Credit bureaus can dismiss claims without enough backup information as quote-unquote frivolous, and resubmitted claims can be denied if they're considered similar to previous ones. Three, create a paper trail. Write a letter explaining the problem. Avoid using standardized online forms provided by the credit bureaus, which might oversimplify your dispute by requiring you to choose among predetermined checkboxes. Four, send all materials by certified mail. Keep copies for yourself. This makes it easier to ensure that the credit bureaus follow the lawful timelines. Credit bureaus have five days to get the disputed information to the financial institution or debt collector that supplied the information. If that company doesn't investigate and respond to the dispute in time, the credit bureaus are legally required to delete the information. Five, if that doesn't work, submit a complaint to the CFPB or the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Explain the error and lack of resolution. Include important dates, amounts, and communications with the credit bureaus and attach any supporting documentation. You can submit a complaint to the CFPB, and that's a link. So if you want to find the link, uh, look at the show notes to get to this article. And finally, six, if you lose your dispute, consider working with an experienced attorney. You can sue a credit bureau or financial institution over credit report errors. Find an attorney through the National Association of Consumer Advocates. So that's all really good information, especially I think the part about disputing errors they might find there. So the key there, obviously, the first part of this is you now have the ability to check these all the time. Back when it was an annual thing, I used to recommend that you get one every four months from each of the bureaus, which would mean that you're getting one from each of them every year or every 12 months, but you're kind of staggering uh, which one you ask for so that you can kind of get them throughout the year. Now, all that's pretty much out the window. You can do it whenever. Nevertheless, I would set reminders for yourself to do this. Uh, and now, really, you could, you know, maybe once a quarter uh, or at least twice a year, I would think, go and get one from all of them uh, and just give them a glance, give them a look over. And if you find errors, maybe come back and find this podcast and look up the uh, recommendations listed here. All right, next up, this is uh, straight from a press release from Proton. And I have cut it down quite a bit. And if you really want to read it, I recommend you do because there's a lot of really interesting technical information about how captures work uh, and some of the thinking, the engineering behind how to create a good one. But uh, here's a little, here's a short version. At Proton, we're always working on new and innovative ways to protect the privacy and data of the Proton community. Sometimes that means developing entirely new services like our Proton Sentinel program, which combines AI and human security analysts to increase the account security for high-profile users. And by the way, uh, that's one of the things we're going to be talking with Andy Yen about very soon. Other times it means taking an old idea and putting a new twist on it, like our new custom-built CAPTCHA. In our What Are CAPTCHAs post, we introduced what CAPTCHAs are, how they work, and a roadmap for future development to keep CAPTCHAs ahead of the game as a first line of defense against bots and spammers on the internet. At Proton, we also need to defend our website against bots and spammers. However, as we investigated available CAPTCHA options, we weren't satisfied, so we decided to develop our own. Our primary goal was to provide a system that doesn't compromise on privacy, usability and accessibility, or security. If you've plotted those three priorities on a chart, we wanted our CAPTCHA to be firmly in the center. Moreover, building our own solution meant that we could resolve current CAPTCHA availability issues for members of the Proton community in countries with restricted internet issues, for example, Iran and Russia. Because of our unique needs, Proton CAPTCHA is the world's first CAPTCHA with censorship-resistant technologies built in. Proton CAPTCHA's differentiator comes in its multi-layered defense strategy, combining visual challenges with computational proof-of-work. Why both? While computational proof of work makes it more costly for attackers to hit a website, it doesn't stop them from doing so. Visual challenges, however, are still effective at stopping the majority of attacks. Combining visual challenges with computational proof of work in CAPTCHA systems creates a multi-layered barrier that offers the following benefits. First, defense in depth. Combining two different types of challenges provides a defense in depth strategy. Even if one layer is compromised, the other layer still provides a level of security. Two, adaptive difficulty. The difficulty of the computational task can be adjusted based on suspicious behavior. For instance, if a user fails a visual CAPTCHA several times, the subsequent proof of work can be made more challenging, slowing down potential bots. 
And third, enhanced accessibility. For users with visual impairments who find traditional captures difficult, computational proof of work offers an alternative way to verify themselves while still providing a layer of protection against bots. Proton Captcha has already been served to millions of users over the past month, with 100% of sign up and login captures now using our in house solution. However, this is only the start of the journey. Our goal is to provide a captcha that is accessible, usable, privacy preserving, and secure against even the most advanced threats. As such, you can expect to see more innovation in this space, with the goal being to reduce the burden of captcha for real users while making it hard for attackers to abuse our services. So again, this article actually goes into a lot more technical detail that I actually found very interesting, but I thought, you know, a good portion of you might not, but it's a really interesting problem. I mean, again, they're trying to keep out the bots, right? Trying to keep out automated systems from creating accounts and doing other things, you know, by inserting this test that makes it hard for bots to get past, but easier for humans to get past. And the ones we're used to seeing now are, you know, like the, usually the nine square or the 12 square thing where you've got to pick out all of the bikes or pick out all the mountains or whatever, some visual thing, which is a real pain in the butt, honestly. Uh, the ones that these guys are using are actually much simpler uh, and much easier to do. Like it, one of them is a, what looks like a puzzle, like a completed puzzle with one piece missing. And all you have to do is drag the piece in place. Apparently that is something that is difficult for automated systems to do. I, I'm not sure why, uh, but they've got some other ones like that too. And these guys are putting in the science, you know, they're actually doing the research to figure out, you know, which of these things are difficult. So the big advantage for me personally is that it's not Google. Google knows way too much about us already. And they do use some of that knowledge in these robot things. If you go to some pages and click the, I'm not a robot thing, you'll never even get challenged because Google knows so, so much about you at that point. They're like, yeah, I know this is a human because they, record a lot of information about you. And while that's really nice and, you know, making the captures simple for, for humans, uh, it, it does mean that every site using these things is just giving Google one other opportunity to learn more about you. So anyway, I applaud this effort. I hope to see uh, more people use this in place of Google's captcha. And I think it's, I think it's a good thing. All right, next up, this is from the Washington post. And this is about the FTC or Federal Trade Commission getting real about data brokers. And again, since we just talked to Tom Kemp about this, I thought this was uh, interesting and timely. A top Federal Trade Commission official is slated to fire a warning shot against the data broker industry on Thursday, and I believe this is last Thursday, speaking out in a key address against a fever by companies to scoop up and trade consumers' personal information with little or no regard for their privacy or well-being. Delivering a speech this morning... At a major data summit, Sam Levine, the FTC's consumer protection chief, is poised to speak out against what he calls a trend of data brokers looking to maximize how much information they can extract from consumers at all costs. And this is a quote from Levine, quote, I believe this maximization model is posing serious threats to our constitutional liberties as Americans, our freedom of worship, our freedom of assembly, and our freedom of association, unquote. The remarks signal the agency is dialing up scrutiny of how little-known data brokers can pose significant risks to consumers and could foreshadow more stringent enforcement against bad actors who trample on user privacy. In addition to undermining privacy, Levine said in the address, brokers are also at times threatening consumers' personal safety and freedoms by creating, quote, detailed digital dossiers on almost every American, unquote, that can easily be weaponized. Their actions, he says, stand in stark contrast to the growing calls from regulators and legislators for companies to limit their collection to what is strictly needed by their services, a practice known as data minimization. Levine will also urge companies to more closely vet what brokers they partner with and to implement more robust privacy practices. Another quote from Levine, quote, As your industry faces increased scrutiny from consumer protection agencies, (laughs) hint, hint, From the intelligence community, from Congress, and from the Supreme Court, implementing these steps could go a long way towards addressing serious concerns that are emerging across the government and across the political spectrum, unquote. The agency last year filed one of its first major lawsuits against a prominent data broker under Democratic Chair Lena Khan, accusing Kocheva of inappropriately selling location data that could be used to track visits to abortion clinics and other sensitive places. But the effort was dealt a blow in May when a federal judge in Idaho dismissed the case, arguing that the agency failed to provide enough evidence to back up their claim that the company's data selling and privacy practices would lead to harm. Levine's planned remarks, however, suggest that the FTC is unlikely to shy away from future legal fights with brokers, despite the recent setback against Kocheva. The industry has launched a slew of initiatives aimed at reining in companies' data privacy practices under Khan beyond its more recent data broker work. 
The agency last year launched a sprawling process to create new privacy rules around quote unquote commercial surveillance, a closely watched effort that could tee up more aggressive enforcement. So this is really just more of an update. The FTC has been battling this uh, under Lena Khan and doing some great work. I obviously disagree with the court finding uh, of Kosheva, and, and this is something we need to fix in general. It'd be, I, I guess this will probably take legislation, but the this notion of harm, you know, trying to say that, well, you know, my data has been sold. Well, okay, prove that that actually cost you harm. First of all, it's really hard to prove that because it's, it's really hard to know who has my data and what they did with it and how they got it. So just, you know, chain of custody kind of thing, trying to figure out, well, when this thing happened over here, it was a direct result of what this data broker did over there is really hard to prove. So I think we need to come out and say that my information, just by getting out of out of my control and being used by someone else is harm enough, because it's really too late once the harm is done, right? It's, it's quite obvious that that information can be used for things like identity theft, stalking, and, and various other things that impinge upon our liberties. And I think we need to make it clear that you know, to show harm doesn't necessarily mean you actually have to trace it back from a, something that actually did finally go bad all the way back to where that data came from. Because that's honestly just not possible. And the real harm is that that data is out there in the first place waiting to be abused. All right, next up, I've got a couple of articles around LastPass. And the reason I'm bringing this up now is because LastPass has recently sent out emails to its customers telling them that they must update their master passwords to be at least 12 characters long. So if you are a LastPass customer and you got this, I thought you might be interested to kind of get this update. Uh, and then because this looks so bad for password managers in general, uh, I found another article that I thought it was very interesting that kind of talks about why you shouldn't judge all password managers by what LastPass did. So let me start off with this first one from Krebs on Security. The password manager service LastPass is now forcing some of its users to pick longer master passwords. LastPass says the changes are needed to ensure all customers are protected by their latest security improvements. But critics say the move is little more than a public relations stunt that will do nothing to help countless early adopters whose password vaults were exposed in a 2022 breach at LastPass. LastPass told customers this week that they would be forced to update their master password if it was less than 12 characters. LastPass officially instituted this change back in 2018, but some undisclosed number of the company's earlier customers were never required to increase the length of their master passwords. This is significant because in November 2022, LastPass disclosed a breach in which hackers stole password vaults containing both encrypted and plain text data for more than 25 million users. Since then, a steady trickle of six-figure cryptocurrency heists targeting security-conscious people throughout the tech industry has led some security experts to conclude that crooks likely have succeeded at cracking open some of the stolen LastPass vaults. Krebs on Security last month interviewed a victim who recently saw more than $3 million worth of cryptocurrency siphoned from his account. That user signed up with LastPass nearly a decade ago, stored their cryptocurrency seed phrases there, and yet never changed his master password, which was just eight characters, nor was he ever forced to improve his master password. That story cited research from Adblock Plus creator Vladimir Palant, who said that LastPass failed to upgrade many older original customers to more secure encryption protections that were offered to newer customers over the years. For example, another important default setting in LastPass is the number of iterations or how many times your master password is run through the company's encryption routines. The more iterations, the longer it takes an offline attacker to crack your master password. Palin said that for many older LastPass users, the initial default setting for iterations was anywhere from 1 to 500. By 2013, new LastPass customers were given 5,000 iterations by default. And by February 2018, LastPass changed the default to 100,100 iterations. And very recently, it upped that again to 600,000. Still, Palin and others impacted by the 2022 breach at LastPass say their account settings were never forcibly upgraded. LastPass CEO Kareem Tuba said that changing master password length, or even the master password itself, is not designed to address already stolen vaults that are offline. And this is a quote from Tuba, quote, this is meant to better protect customers' online vaults and encourage them to bring their accounts up to the 2018 LastPass standard default setting of a 12-character minimum password, but that they could have opted out from. We know that some customers may have chosen convenience over security and utilized less complex master passwords despite encouragement to use our and others' password generator to do otherwise, unquote. 
LastPass has always emphasized that if you lose this master password, that's too bad because they don't store it and their encryption is so strong that even they can't help you recover it. But experts say all bets are off when cyber crooks can get their hands on the encrypted vault data itself, as opposed to having to interact with LastPass via its website. These so-called offline attacks allow the bad guys to conduct unlimited and unfettered brute force password cracking attempts against the encrypted data using powerful computers that can each try millions of password guesses per second. Nicholas Weaver, a researcher at the University of California, Berkeley's International Computer Science Institute and lecturer at UC Davis, and by the way, somebody I've had on the show a while back and who I am working to bring back soon, said LastPass made a huge mistake years ago by not force upgrading the iteration count for existing users. And this is a quote from uh, Weaver, quote, and now this is blaming the users. You should have used a longer passphrase, not them for having weak defaults that were never upgraded for existing users. LastPass in my book is one step above snake oil. I used to be pick whatever password manager you want, but now I am very much pick any password manager but LastPass, unquote. All right, so I said I would come back to that statement. I, 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 I really, uh, Nick Weaver kind of said it for me, and that is you're, you're just blaming the users. I mean, you can't do that. <laughs> You've got to bring them with you, uh, it's, uh, obviously, because most people just won't do it if they're not forced to. And LastPass should have forced people along the way to increase their iteration counts uh, and also to uh, increase their, their base pa master passwords. So again, because your vaults were stored uh, with LastPass and the entire vaults were stolen you know, sometime uh, late last year, it doesn't really matter what you set it to now in terms of those bad guys being able to get into your uh, your password vault. Uh, because it's the, the, the copy that they have, the backup version they have, is locked with whatever password you were using at that time. So updating your password now is still a good idea, but it's not going to protect any of the stuff that you had in the stolen version. Likewise, updating your iteration count is good, and I would absolutely do it if you're sticking with LastPass. And I think they actually did force you to do this recently. But again, it's not going to help the vault they already have. So if you have information in the vault that was stolen last year, and you are worried that the password you had and the iteration count you had on that copy of the vault as it was stolen at that time, then you really need to be going through your vault and changing uh, all your passwords, at least of the ones that matter, you know, kind of do it in priority order. And if there's any secrets that were contained in your vault that you can't change, like social security numbers and things like that, then that's even more of a reason why you should be putting a, a credit freeze on your, on your credit accounts and be, you know, keeping a close eye on your credit reports and being very vigilant against identity theft. But as I read that, and as I read this article, I read another article that I think is also really good to keep in mind. And that is, don't think of all password managers like LastPass. There's a reason why LastPass got as bad as they did. And this, this article kind of goes into that. So this is from ZDNet. And let me, this is a little bit long, but I think it's important. I've written a lot about password management during the past few years. Indeed, when people ask me what kind of security software they should use, my answer always starts with, find a good password manager and use it. When I have those discussions in real life, I consistently hear the same questions and objections, most of which are perfectly sensible and need to be answered. This comment posted in response to my recent post about online security is a great example. And this is the comment that was posted. Speaking of password managers, I'd be a bit leery since LastPass was hacked and users' encrypted password files were leaked. Black hats have been trying to crack their master passwords and apparently succeeded in some cases, even stealing the contents of people's crypto wallets. The natural question is, are password managers still such a great idea when this kind of thing can happen? The affected users had to spend countless hours changing their dozens or hundreds of passwords everywhere. That'd be way too much of a chore and a headache. Aside from third-party products like LastPass, can we rely on built-in password managers in Firefox, Chrome, and Edge? I suppose these have big companies behind them doing their best to keep away a massively compromising and embarrassing situation, but then I'm sure LastPass did the same. And then back to the article with this guy's response. That's an admirably concise summary of the issues with password managers that I think most people are concerned about. It also raises a whole bunch of questions about what LastPass did exactly. So let's start with a quick summary of what the LastPass security mess was and why it was uniquely awful for its customers. Among online services that help you organize your passwords, LastPass was an early leader and is still a significant player. The LastPass brand was valuable enough that LogMeIn acquired the company eight years ago for $110 million. 
A few years later, LastPass was spun off into its own company, but it was still controlled by the private equity firms that owned LogMeIn. In its account of sale, the PC Mag noted that those companies, quote, specialize in trying to maximize the value of an asset for later sale, unquote. This is not the sort of reassuring description you want to see for a security firm. The result, as I wrote near the end of 2022, was predictable. And this is a quote of himself from a previous article, quote, LastPass got gobbled up by LogMeIn back in 2015, and then in 2021, LogMeIn announced it was planning to spin LastPass off as a separate company. Astute observers of the software industry know that this playbook rarely works out well. At the very best, your employees are distracted by the whole M&A song and dance. At worst, well, here we are, unquote. The bad news is that a lot of customer data was stolen. The good news is that the password vaults were encrypted using 256 AES technology, with a unique encryption key derived from the user's password, which was never shared with LastPass, meaning that it would take an extraordinary amount of time and computing resources to crack them. However, LastPass did not apply the same strong encryption to other customer data, including website URLs and, quote, certain use cases involving email addresses, unquote. That information turned out to be incredibly valuable as a way for attackers to sort out which password vaults would be most valuable. According to security expert Brian Krebs, that targeting might explain a wave of attacks against cryptocurrency wallets that started shortly after the LastPass hack. And that's actually a reference back to the articles I was just reading. Every indication is that LastPass has been running an incredibly sloppy operation for years. The employee who was targeted was one of only four DevOps engineers with access to the AWS decryption keys. You would think that anyone accessing the most sensitive customer data would have been using a dedicated PC running over a secure network, but that didn't happen here. LastPass had previously increased the required length of its customer master passwords from 8 to 12 characters and had also increased the number, number of iterations used for generating private keys from those new, stronger passwords. Unfortunately, the company hadn't required users to change existing passwords, which meant any longtime customer who was using an older password was using weak encryption that was dramatically more vulnerable to brute force attacks. As part of its incident follow-up, LastPass announced an extensive list of changes in its security policies, but the damage was already done. So isn't putting all your passwords in a single place just asking for trouble? Yes, in theory. But a dedicated password manager is still the only practical way for human beings with ordinary human memories to create and recall strong, unique, random passwords for every secure service they use. To use a pointed analogy, if you had $10,000 in cash, would you rather store each $100 bill in a cheap piggy bank with a toy lock, or would you prefer to stick that wad of cash in the bank where it's in a massive vault with state-of-the-art locks and armed security guards? What LastPass did was akin to leaving the keys to the vault on the counter while forgetting to lock the front door. Anyway, if you're going to put your passwords in an encrypted vault, the challenge is to protect that vault. And here's the most important thing. Strong encryption really works. Every modern password management service, including LastPass, uses a zero-knowledge model, which means that the service does not have access to your private encryption key or the master password you use to access your account. The attackers who broke into the LastPass network had stolen backups of a presumably large number of password vaults and were, therefore, capable of running sustained brute force attacks against the encrypted data. Despite the advantage, the attackers have apparently only been able to break into a few per month and then only by targeting those they were certain contained crypto wallet keys. It probably required a staggering amount of resources to do so. It took a combination of a very determined hacker and a very sloppy operation at LastPass to allow those encrypted password vault files to be stolen. I'm not aware of any other password service that has lost that kind of customer data. If it had happened, it would have been front page news. If you're really worried about the possibility that someone will steal your encrypted password data, you can choose a password manager like KeePass, which allows you to store the encrypted vault in a separate location where you're more confident of its security. But a well-run password manager service, not LastPass, should be able to handle this task as part of its day-to-day -day operations. If someone steals my master password, don't they have access to everything in my password vault? Not if your password management service is doing its job and requiring extra authentication on a new device, as would be the case if an attacker stole your credentials and then tried to use them from their own device. When you access one password from a device that you haven't previously used, for example, you have to enter your master password and also enter your secret key, which consists of 34 letters and numbers that you, and only you, know. 
The key is generated when you set up your account for the first time, and you're encouraged to print it out or save it in a secure location so you can access it when you set up a new device. It's never shared with 1Password Cloud. An attacker who stole your master password would not be able to access your encrypted vault because they wouldn't be able to provide that key. In addition, most password managers allow you to set up two-factor authentication, which requires you to use a trusted device to approve any new sign-in before allowing access to your account and the vault data. Here too, an attacker who has your master password won't be able to use it without getting your permission and alerting you in the process. And one final question he poses, can I just use a browser-based password manager? For as long as I can remember, every browser maker has offered a set of password filling features. Years ago, these features were rudimentary and it made sense to choose a third party option. In recent years though, all the major developers responsible for modern browsers, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Mozilla, have made tremendous progress with their authentication solutions, making them equal to the core feature set of a good third party password manager. And because they're all free and use well-managed cloud storage, they're perfectly acceptable options. And I'll come back to that in a second. Earlier this year, I wrote a lengthy article titled, quote, how to manage and use a password manager, end quote. Scroll down to the R built-in password managers good enough heading for capsule reviews and of what you get from Apple, Google, and Microsoft. From a usability standpoint, you're probably better off with a third-party service, as long as it's not run by you-know-who. So I thought that brought up some really good points, and uh, I know that Password managers are hard to use, and that's actually going to come into play with <laughs> with another article I'm going to read here in a minute. But they really are your best solution today. Pass keys are going to be really great when they finally roll out and become ubiquitous and they solve the multi-device, multi-platform problem. And those solutions are actually right around the corner from what I can tell. It sounds like Bitwarden's going to have something out next month. One password, I think, is close to having that as well. The problem being, just quickly with passkeys, that you know, if you use the one that's built into the operating system, it's not going to work cross-platform. So if you're actually somebody who has an iPhone but also a Windows PC, you know, those those things are not going to synchronize. So we really need solutions that will synchronize across platforms, and we're still waiting on on that to come out. But anyway, the point here is that password managers still today are are your best option, and don't let this whole LastPass fiasco turn you away from from using them. Now, this person does seem to think that the built-in password managers that are in browsers, the, the things that will automatically fill in form fields for you, are as good as things like, you know, LastPass, 1Password, Bitwarden. I'm not sure that I'm agreeing with that just yet. Uh, but there's also the other issue of, let's say you're using a Chrome browser, uh, and you're logged into your Chrome browser, and so you can get to your passwords from any, of your, any Chrome browser if you're, that you're logged into. That means that if you somehow lose access to your Google Chrome account, if somebody hacks your Google Chrome account, then they also get access to your passwords. That's just a little bit too much information with one service for me. And so anyway, I I personally still use a third-party password manager. Uh, I'm actually still kind of stuck on LastPass, though. I really need to get into Bitwarden. But, uh, you know, I've got a, my whole family's on it, and we share passwords together, so it's it's not just me. I've got to get everybody moved with me, so it's kind of a pain. But I do fully intend to to move us to Bitwarden here at some point soon. All right, another little quick article here from The Verge, and this is about mobile car payments. Hyundai announced a new feature called Hyundai Pay that lets owners of the 2024 Hyundai Kona pay for parking at several thousand locations directly from their car's infotainment screen. It's the latest example of the auto industry's multi-year effort to make in-car payments a real thing. Users input their preferred credit card into the app on their infotainment screens, which then can be used to pay for parking at participating Parkopedia locations. The vehicle then uses its cellular connection to communicate with Parkopedia's software to complete the transaction. Personal details are kept secure using tokenization, which replaces card account details with a unique digital identifier or token that Hyundai says keeps data safe. The system uses Hyundai's Blue Link Plus connected car service that is also used to connect people's cars to smart devices like smartwatches and smart speakers. The feature is launching with the 2024 Hyundai Kona, but nine other models are expected to get the feature through over-the-air software updates or model year changeovers. The automaker's electric vehicles will get in-car payment features unique to their lineup. Hyundai sounds bullish about the possibilities of in-car payments, calling future use, use cases quote-unquote exciting. Other automakers may disagree. 
General Motors, for example, launched its own in-car shopping app called Marketplace in the hopes that customers would use it to buy gas, coffee, parking, and even make restaurant reservations. But GM ended up shuttering it, blaming a third-party software supplier. That decision represents the downside of the connected car future that automakers typically avoid talking about. While they like to tout the benefits of the -the over-the-air software updates and safety benefits like vehicle-to-everything communication, they don't address how quickly these features can be taken away if they aren't growing customers or justifying their costs through revenue. So let me just say here and now, I would never ever give my car my credit card information. They don't need it. What I really want actually is for things like CarPlay and Google Google Play, uh, or whatever the whatever the, the Android version of CarPlay is, to give them access to that sort of thing. Because I trust Apple with the credit cards. I use Apple Pay all the time and love it. And what I really would want is for my car to just be the bridge or the broker for that so that I don't have to also give that information to the car company because the car company is going to data mine the hell out of that information. And frankly, I just don't want another party to have to trust with, you know, financial stuff like that. So anyway, uh, interesting idea. I like the convenience, obviously, but the security and privacy aspects of this would make me never want to do such a thing. All right, one more news article, and then I've got another one that's, I guess, kind of news that's going to be our tip of the week. But I thought this was a very interesting blog article from a site called The Privacy Dad. And the title of the article is Privacy Tools Are Not Worth the Hassle. I would disagree with that. Uh, I think they are difficult to use, but I think he brings up a lot of very good points uh, in this article that I think are worth discussing. So I'm not going to read the whole thing, but let me read the important parts. I recently published an email discussion in which a friend posed challenges to the adoption of privacy-preserving tools and platforms. There's a real value in exploring opposing viewpoints to digital privacy. I will begin this short series by steel manning one of the common complaints about privacy tools, which is that they are too difficult to set up and manage. But first, I will review what it means to steel man an argument. And he goes into this long philosophical discussion of this. I'm just going to say that it this is basically the opposite of straw manning something where you kind of restate your debate opponent's point of view in a way that's easy to refute. Steel manning is basically the opposite. It's t- respecting the person that you're debating with and trying to restate or paraphrase or even beef up their arguments the best way you know how, showing that you understand what they're saying and that you can restate it in in, in other terms and actually potentially even enhance their argument. I think it's an interesting philosophical discussion, but that's the gist of it. And I'm not going to redefine that here. He goes on to say that often privacy tools are complicated to set up and maintain. And here are some of the issues I've run into. And again, I'm not going to get into these. Some of these are pretty esoteric ones that you may not have heard of. Um, like he had trouble using Google, which is this interesting way to self host a Google search engine thing such that you could get all the Google results without all the Google tracking. Uh, and he talks about, you know, some other tools that, that I may have talked about before and some that I haven't. Um, but without getting into all those details, let me just go on and say he had a lot of problems himself with some of the tools that he chose to use for enhancing his privacy. A technically savvy reader probably knows the solutions to most or all of these problems. I myself will eventually figure out how to solve some of these problems with support from the often excellent help desk services and online documentation. I present the above list of problems as evidence of the hassle of using privacy tools. From these experiences, we can extract the following steel man arguments against the adoption of privacy preserving tools and platforms. As an exercise in steel manning, I want to encourage privacy fans to set aside the natural urge to formulate counter arguments and instead ask if these are the most charitable versions of the argument or if there's a better way to put them. One, privacy tools are too complicated. Open source tools and privacy platforms are often the results of a labor of love and a belief in the importance of providing these tools. Now that I have worked with a large number of them, it seems almost a given that one, installation might require a manual, two, updates won't happen automatically, three, there will be bugs and fixing them requires going to the forums, getting help off Reddit, reading the manual, and even reinstalling everything. Two, privacy tools cause unnecessary stress. I enjoy spending time learning and figuring things out, so I often don't mind tinkering and fixing when something goes wrong with one of the tools I use. However, we don't always have time to read manuals or make backups and updates. When Google stopped working last month, I told my kids to use another search engine for now. Fixing the problem is on my to-do list. Three, end-to-end encryption asks too much from the user. 
This evening, I am writing this blog whilst locked out of all my notes on standard notes. I understand my responsibility in carefully storing passwords with end-to-end encryption software, and I know the company cannot retrieve them. That is the strength of the system, privacy-wise. I keep diligent records and a password tool, and yet something went wrong. The moment I first realized that this had happened, I felt a disquieting despair at the thought of losing years worth of notes in just one moment. Four, privacy tools hinder workflow. If someone without a background in IT has to keep PDF documents and notes in order to manage an app, then it is a barrier to a good workflow. Five, people are not good at performing scheduled tasks. I have set reminders in various places, but currently my Monero node needs updating. Mining has stopped. My next cloud seems to magically take care of itself for now. I have pages of long strings of terminal commands beginning with sudo to help me remember how to update devices, backup data, start a miner, pause an app so I can update it, find a Docker ID number, etc. But I've fallen behind. I know about automated tasks, but I'm not quite there yet. Six, many privacy tools are unreliable by nature because they try to circumnavigate corporations and governments. I'm thinking he might mean circumvent. Anyway, when the Aurora store stopped working on my Calyx OS phone, it was a problem that lasted for months. The experience made me realize you have to watch out for weaknesses in the chain of any privacy tool. A phone without a store with access to mainstream apps is unusable for anyone, but for the most diehard privacy advocate. Monero is a fantastic cryptocurrency, but governments are currently working on making it illegal to transact with it. Microsoft is the parent company to GitHub, but developers can stop working on projects. And finally, seven, recommending a privacy tool can backfire. A negative experience can turn someone off of the idea of digital tools and privacy. I persuaded a friend to switch to Tutanota. They used it for half a year, then switched back to something more mainstream. The little hurdles got in the way for this person who has no interest in tinkering and just wants a tool that works smoothly. They had to deal with the extra hassle of informing friends of a changed email address twice rather than once and are not likely to follow my advice again. So this is this guy's reflections on this whole topic. I am sure there are more arguments out there. I wonder how easy or difficult it was for readers, if you made it all the way to the end, to resist the urge to think, yeah, but... Needless to say, there are many excellent counter arguments, which is what the Privacy Dad blog is all about. The lack of user friendliness and the disruption to workflow are major problems. For mass adoption, privacy tools need to be as good or even better than the mainstream competition. Most people are not interested in how their bike works, they just want to ride it and know where to get it repaired. The same is true for software. I happen to have developed an interest and have turned tinkering and note taking into a hobby, but I'm the odd one out amongst my circles. The tools should bring people to greater privacy. As long as that model is reversed and belief in digital privacy is a requirement to seeking out the right tools, adoption will be slow and only for a niche audience. The good news is that I have seen tools appear that do work as well or better than their data hoarding competitors. Most of my friends now use Signal daily without even thinking about its privacy goal. My family uses Bitwarden to store passwords. My Nextcloud server continues to run and update itself for now. So I think this guy brings up a lot of important points and and I'm, with, I'm right with this guy. I mean, obviously I have drunk the Kool-Aid. I am all into privacy tools, but as I try to explain these to others and try to get others to use them, I quickly find that resistance to these tools because they're just not as easy to use. Uh, and there are workflow issues. There are complexity issues. There are a lot of times open source projects that are not straightforward to you know, install or maintain and update. A lot of these tools were written by, you know, people like me, software engineers who have great ideas in terms of the technology behind them, but are really bad at creating user interfaces, for example. So at the end of the day, we really need the companies that are making the regular products to just build privacy and security in by design and make it transparent to the end user. We shouldn't be requiring users to go so far above and beyond to maintain their privacy and security. It just has to be there. It has to, it has to be built in and it has to be as good or better than the existing products or people just won't use them. Or like this guy's friend, he he talked him into using something and shortly he's like, nope, I give up. I'm out because it just wasn't easy. Actually, I I can totally understand because I actually tried using Tutanota for a while and I gave up. Uh, I use ProtonMail, which I happen to like a lot better, but you know, Tutanota has some great boxes checked in terms of security and privacy, but it is not fun to use. And when people are used to using something like Gmail 
which is a really slick user interface, and then they go to something like this, they're really turned off. Anyway, I think this brings up a lot of really good points, and I understand this. Believe me, I understand this. Uh, so it really makes it hard for, for us in the privacy advocate space to get people to switch to some of these things because they really are, in a lot of cases, inferior, certainly in terms of usability. So anyway, a call to Apple and, and Microsoft and, and even Google, uh, if they can get their act straight, to build security and privacy into their products and so that it's transparent and completely seamless uh, for their users to use and pleasurable for their users to use. We haven't gotten there yet, but I hope hopefully we will be. All right, one last article, and this is actually also going to double as my tip of the week. Uh, iOS 17 just came out. Uh, the new iPhones were just announced, and whenever Apple announces their new iPhones and, uh, and such, they also release a new version of their iOS operating system for their iPhones and iPads. And uh, there are lots of crazy features, uh, a lot of good features in the new iOS 17, but I want to focus on some of the privacy and security features. So I'm going to read this article from TechCrunch and then I'll give you my comments. But I basically, my tip of the week for this week is look at these features and seriously consider turning these on. Apple's long-awaited iOS 17 update for iPhones lands today, and this would have been last week, with a number of new and improved security features. Many of the new features are aimed at protecting iPhone users who are at greater risk of cyber attacks and spyware like journalists, activists, and human rights defenders. Other iOS features are better suited for the wider population, including anti-web tracking and safely storing passwords and the easy sharing of newer phishing-resistant pass keys. So first up, lockdown mode. The biggest addition to lockdown mode is it now runs on Apple Watch, not just iPhones, iPads, and Macs. It can't come soon enough, given that recent exploits used to plant spyware have been capable of compromising Apple Watch owners. Lockdown mode works by selectively turning off certain iPhone and watch features that have been abused by spyware makers in the past, such as iMessage and HomeKit, making it far more difficult to break into a device and steal its data. Lockdown mode in iOS 17 also automatically removes the geolocation data from photos by default when sharing photos with other people, such as where the photo was taken, which could reveal where a person is located. Other nifty features means iPhones in lockdown mode will block automatically joining non-secure Wi-Fi networks that could allow a person on the same network to analyze an iPhone's network traffic. Lockdown mode also blocks connections to 2G cellular networks. This aims to block a range of cellular-based exploits that are often used by cell site simulators or stingrays, which law enforcement used to trick nearby phones into connecting to fake cell base stations and track phone locations and snoop on calls and messages. Stingrays are controversial because they work over a wide area and are indiscriminate in which devices they ensnare iOS 7 now has more anti-web tracking features. iOS 17's Safari browser now strips tracking information from web addresses that can be used to uniquely identify your device and track you across the web. This makes it more difficult for websites and advertisers to see which other sites you access. You can select this feature in your Safari settings on iOS 17 to work when you're using private browsing, or you can apply it to all browsing sessions to really make a dent, and I would certainly do it for all sessions. This shouldn't affect or break your day-to-day -day browsing experience. Private browsing will also lock by default, prompting the device owner to scan their face or fingerprint before their private tabs will open. And then finally, check in safety features and avoiding scammers. Passkeys, the phishing-resistant password replacement that allows you to log in without worrying that your passwords might get stolen, are getting an update. Tons of sites and services already support passkeys. Apple, Google, Microsoft, PayPal, and plenty of others. Before long, you'll be password-free for good. You can now share passkeys, and passwords if you must, with friends and family. Passkeys and passwords are shared using end-to-end -end encryption, so nobody other than those in the group can access them, not even Apple. Check-in is a new feature that lets iPhone owners share with friends when they plan to arrive at their destination safely. The feature monitors the person's real-time location and will alert a friend if something goes wrong. This location data is end-to-end encrypted, negating the need for third-party apps that have sold your location data to advertisers and data brokers. And finally, live transcription is an added bonus for folks who never want to be bothered by a spam or scam call again. Instead of answering or declining the phone call, uh, both of which can notify the caller that the line is active, live transcription converts the caller's voice into text displayed on the screen in real time. Now, it stops right there, but basically live transcription is uh, when, I, when you're getting a call, if you just don't answer it and it rolls to voicemail, if they leave you a voicemail, if they start talking, uh, your phone will start showing you what they're saying uh, and give you the chance to pick up that call. 
in most cases, if you're if you're like me and you get spam calls all the damn time, they don't leave messages. And if they do, they're robo calls and you can see these things and you'll never answer it. But it will be nice in that one case where you're waiting from some a call from somebody who's maybe not in your contact list. You know, maybe you're a plumber or handyman or a, a, a kind of a strange doctor visit that's you know, from a doctor you don't normally visit and you're getting a call and you need to get that call. If they're starting to leave a message and you're like, oh, hey, Carrie, this is so-and-so from Dr. So-and-so's office, you could pick that call up uh, instead of letting it go to voicemail. So it's kind of a neat feature. I think the check-in feature is really cool. My daughter for a long time has, you know, whenever she's in a situation where she's maybe got a long a walk a long way in the dark by herself or whatever, uh, will call one of us and her family just to talk to her while she's, you know, walking just to you know, kind of keep her safe in case something should go wrong. Uh, this feature is really kind of cool. It basically lets you tell a friend or designate a friend to say, I'm going home and I should be there in 20 minutes. And your phone is keeping track of you going home. And if you don't get there in 20 minutes, we'll check with you and say, hey, do you want to add some more time to this? You know, did you stop and talk to somebody or, you know, did you get distracted? Uh, do you want to update your ETA? Uh, or if not, if you don't respond, it will eventually say, hey, your friend said they were going to be here in 20 minutes. They didn't. Uh, here's their last known location. Here's the path they were on. Here's even their phone battery level uh, in case their phone is low on battery. Uh, it's really kind of neat. It's all automated. I think that, I think that's great. Um, and it's all done with privacy in mind. I think it's a really cool feature. And again, lockdown mode, I've talked about this recently. I'm seriously considering just putting my phone in lockdown mode all the time. Uh, it, it says it's for, you know, dissidents and politicians and stuff, but uh, it does some really good stuff. Honestly, some things that I at least wish were available as options in the settings that I could turn on individually, but as kind of a blanket thing, I, most of these things are really not that intrusive and don't get in the way that much, but are really good at, at protecting your phone. So uh, I think lockdown mode obviously is fantastic. And, and I would seriously consider just turning it on no matter who you are. So that, there it is. That's your news. And that is your tip of the week. All right, that will do it for this week. A couple things before we go. First of all, still looking for some more Dear Carrie questions. I have gotten a couple. Uh, and again, when I get these things through email, when you send it to Dear Carrie at firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com, I usually answer right away, but I'm saving some of them up to actually answer on the show as well. And so uh, I need some more, uh, and I would love to get your questions. So if you go to fdsd.me slash Q&A, you'll get all the details about that. If you want, you can even send me a, an audio clip of you asking the question, and I'll play you actually asking your question on the air. So it, if you send me your Dear Craig questions, I would put everybody who sends me a valid question into a bin. And once a month, I pull a name out of that hat and give them a free PDF copy of my book. So there's some incentive for doing it. But also, if you've got the question, somebody else probably does too. And I've gotten some very interesting questions and ones that I would like to share with the rest of the audience. So send me your dear carry questions. I will queue them up and I promise I eventually will answer them on the air, but I will at least answer them directly with you pretty much when you send them. So we're about to get into October, which means November and December are right around the corner. Toward the end of the year, I have a couple special shows that I do around Thanksgiving. I do my annual best and worst gift guide, and I'm looking for some suggestions. I've obviously got plenty of fodder for worst gifts in terms of security and privacy. But if you've run across something you think is really cool that is better than the average product in terms of privacy or security or has some really interesting privacy and security features, and you think it might make a fun suggestion as a holiday gift, uh, use the Dear Carrie thing to send me your suggestions. If I use your suggestion, I will throw your name in the same hat for getting a free copy of the book that I give out once a month. I'm looking for some interesting new ideas. So if you've got one, send it to the Dear Carrie email address. Next week, I will be playing my uh, interview with Nick Oles, the author of How to Catch a Fish. And as part of that, we will be having a contest to win a free physical copy of his book. I think we're going to give out five copies. It's a great book. And uh, so next week, be sure to listen in and I'll tell you how you can register to win a free copy. I just recorded my interview with Cory Doctorow. He is a riot. <laughs> he is such a fun guy to talk to. Very interesting topic. Uh, that interview will be coming up soon as well. Before then, I'll be playing my interview with Andy Yen about, uh, from Proton about their Proton Sentinel service and uh, talking about personal threat modeling. And I've got so many other guests and interviews in the works, some really cool, uh, really cool guests and topics coming up. So uh, if you have not already, subscribe, and that way you won't miss any of this. That'll do it for this week, everybody. Take care out there. Stay safe. And until next week, as always, don't get caught with your drawbridge down. <laughs>